Hi, everyone, and welcome to Behind the Numbers. My name is Dave Bookbinder, and welcome back to the show that digs deeper to understand what matters most in business. Today, we're going to be talking about using operations management as a competitive advantage. And I'm very pleased to welcome Tommy Yanolis, who's the founder of Ops Analytica. Tommy, welcome to Behind the Numbers. Oh, thank you very much for having me, Dave. Really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, no, my pleasure. Uh, eager to have this conversation with you about a new competitive advantage. Everybody who's going to be watching and listening, certainly going to lean into the speaker just a little bit more closely here to hear everything you have to say about it. But before we jump into that secret sauce, if you will, let's talk a little bit about uh, the company. It's a software as a service, a SaaS company. Tell the audience a little bit about who you are and what you do. Sure. So we founded, uh, we're a bootstrap startup, so we founded ourselves in 2015. We actually started building the platform in 2013 at another company and then spun off Ops Analytica. Ops Analytica stands for Operations Analytics. It's our goal to help our clients manage their field team operations, manage the people doing the stuff at the locations and then help them measure and analyze what's actually happening. So ultimately they can identify issues faster, uh, put in uh, fixes faster and ultimately end up not um, irritating as many customers. Well, no customer wants to be irritated. So let's explore just a little <laughs> bit more here. I, I'd like you to help define operations management when you talk about the platform and the types of things that you're able to do to help companies. And ultimately, at the end of the day, what we're going to get to here is the idea that what you're creating is a consistent and hopefully better customer experience. But let, let's talk about defining what operations management means. Sure. So every multi locate, every business has operations, right? Operations are all the things that you do so that you can uh, take an order and then deliver your uh, good or service to the customer and collect money. It's all that stuff. And when we're talking large multi-location chains, think about restaurants, think about auto, think about your dentist office. They've got to be clean and inviting. They've got to have, they got to be stocked and staffed and ready to go so that when they open the door for business, they can run people through, right? And, and you know, sell egg McMuffins, clean teeth, uh, change tires, whatever it is. So. Operations management is going out and actually like, uh, that's all the things they have to do. What we're trying to help them do is move from a uh, paper-based world where they have checklists and they train for memorization and they've got like things taped to the wall and we're moving them into a technological world where they're now everything's on a tablet or a phone and we can guide people through their day and we can ensure that at the store level they're getting everything done so they're not missing things that can impact sales or customer satisfaction and then as you go up the chain of command at the above store level now you've got one uh, area director who can manage all of their locations uh, digitally versus having to be in the building looking at what's going on. So we're just trying to facilitate better operations across the board for these large multi-location businesses. Yeah, so let, let's make an example here if you can, maybe share a story with us so the audience understands kind of what we're speaking to here. Um, you mentioned restaurants, I think everybody can relate to it. We've all gone to restaurants, we're still going to restaurants. Um, and we've all had various experiences at restaurants and many of them could certainly be better. Talk a little bit about a restaurant example, if you would, Tommy, about how sure. they're using your, your software platform to create that better experience. Sure. So I'll give you a great example. How many times have you been driving to work and you're like, man, I really want like a, I want to get breakfast really quick and I'm going to go to McDonald's or I'm going to go to Starbucks. And as you're driving up to the building, you see that the line of cars is abnormally long. Like, you know, in your mind, if the car is like in front of this store or this part of the drive through, you can actually get your the food you want in a reasonable amount of time. It should take five to six minutes to get through the line. Right. But now you see the lines too far. It's too long. Right. So then you just drive by. That's the first example I'll give you on operations management that, you know, that store isn't just extra busy that day. It doesn't really work that way. That store is having an operational issue somewhere in, in the business that's causing it to go slower, have a slower speed of service, 
and therefore cars are backing up and you made the decision to drive by. That's how operations, bad operations affect sales. People walk out the door. I've literally walked into a subway, saw the line, saw one person behind the counter and just turned around and left because I knew I didn't have an hour to watch like this senior citizen make 50 subs. You know what I mean? But then when you go into a restaurant too, so many times it's either going to be like, it's, it's generally not one giant thing that's wrong. It's always this sort of death by a thousand cut things. You know, you walk in, you're expecting to go to the counter, order an egg McMuffin meal, have cream and sugar and napkins and ketchup and all those things, get the food in two minutes and leave. But you walk in and the floor is sticky and then it takes forever to get your order done. And then you, you, you go to the bathroom and there's no paper towels in the bathroom. And then you're waiting at the counter trying to get ketchup because they didn't give it to you. You know, and it's all these little things that end up happening. And it's like any one of them would have been fine. You would have just laughed it off, ah, whatever. But when you get 20 of those in a row, all of a sudden that's a bad experience. And you only get one to three of those bad experiences with a customer before they start to change their return decision behavior. Basically saying, I'm not gonna go back because these guys are obviously struggling, right? And every time somebody makes that decision, they go, well, I'm not gonna not eat breakfast. So they just go find another place to go. And if that place is doing better than you, they may never come back or might not come back for years, right? So that's what it really comes down to is there's all these things these stores have identified. We've got to do this to be clean, fast and execute, right? And when their teams aren't getting them done, the death by a thousand cuts, customers start leaving. And let me say one last thing. The worst part about this is it's not direct. It's not like you have one bad experience and then it shows up on your bottom line tomorrow so you can identify it quickly and fix it. It might take six months or a year, depending on what kind of like return frequency people have before it actually shows up in the numbers. So you can be irritating so many customers for so long before you actually start to see it in your sales numbers. That's why sales isn't a reliable uh, a KPI for looking at how well you're operating because it's always lagging months behind what's actually happening in the business. Tommy, for folks who are watching and listening and want to learn more about you or Ops Analytica, how can they connect with you? Uh, you know what? You can go to the OpsAnalytica.com website. It'll be in the show notes or hit me up on LinkedIn. I Seriously, all I do now, like well, not all I do, but one of the big things I do is I just want to talk to people and hear what they're struggling with to see if I can be of assistance. So I really do want to talk to people and I truly encourage people to hit me up on LinkedIn or go to the chat on the site and you say, hey, can I talk to Tommy? Because I'll get on a call with you. I'd love to talk to you. Nice. Tommy, we've got about four or so minutes to go here left in this first segment, but I want to just continue on the, on the thread you talked about. So when you talk about walking into a restaurant for the first time and you, you go into the bathroom, the floors are sticky, you're, you're creating an experience and it's a negative impression right out of the box. But similarly, if you've been to a restaurant before where you've had a good experience and now you walk into the restroom and the floor is sticky and it hadn't been before, something's changed. So underlying all of this, the question for you is, using the software, can you overcome any inherent either staffing issues or we'll call it engagement issues with the existing staff to help correct these operational issues? Absolutely. Um, I mean, staffing is tough right now. This is a weird world we live in. It's kind of unprecedented world where people just don't want to work. And so I feel for these guys, but yet, you know, it's a double edged sword because you know, I heard so many people tell me, oh, there's not enough staff. And then I go to the Chick-fil-A by my house and there's like 50 kids in the drive through line with tablets taking orders. So, you know, obviously some people are able to get staff. And so I think those managers have to really reevaluate, OK, what am I paying? What am I making my work environment like to get people in there? Right. Because it's not like. I've got a job and there's 400, it's not the depression and there's 400 people at the door asking for that job. It's the opposite. I've got a job and there's 400 people sitting at home playing video games that I'm trying to lure out of their house to come work for me, right? So, so the first thing is, um, one, we can make it easier. We make it more efficient, right? Like we talk about taking the guesswork out of running the location. We make it more efficient uh, in your operations, which means you can do more with less people and also, we just remind you of all the little things you need to do. If you're trying to do this out of your memory, 
you are going to fail. You know, a person can memorize three to four things max at any one time. And if you're stressed and you're busy and you're running around, you're just going to miss stuff. So just having the checklist in place helps that happen. Now, from an engagement perspective, that really starts to fall on the management above the store, either the general manager or the management above the store who can see what's happening and not happening in our platform. I mean, we always tell our prospects and our clients, like, we're going to tell you what's actually happening, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And it's up to you then as management to take action. So if you see that a store is not engaged, that's a clue for an above store leader or a general manager to spend more time with their team, getting them to understand the why and getting them to do what they're supposed to do, right? Like great teams, uh, block and tackle. And that's what this software does. It's blocking and tackling software. It's say, hey, go do this. This is what you need to do. This is when you need to do it. I'm watching to see that you do it, right? So that's how we kind of can positively impact that for um, the, the organization. Awesome. Tommy, we're going to take a quick commercial break here and we'll continue this conversation in just a moment. So you sit tight. Uh, you folks watching and listening, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back on Behind the Numbers after this quick break. Say we've got grit, and we'll take it as a compliment. Because it's our uncommon drive, our spark within, that brings us together and sets us apart. We are temple made. And when others take shortcuts, when others take breaks, when others take the easy way, we take charge. And welcome back to Behind the Numbers. I'm Dave Bookbinder, and today we're talking with Tommy Anolis, who's the CEO and founder of Ops Analytica. Tommy, welcome back to the second segment here. I uh, want to continue on, on the thread around the software that you're offering here for the operations management piece and, and ask a question that first that hit me and I'm sure maybe some of the audience is thinking as well. When you're thinking about executing checklist type functions at a store level, if you will, as we're talking about with uh, the restaurant example, how do you ensure you know, the, the honest completion of those tasks versus the manual, okay, check, 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 because somebody told me I need to do this. How do you know stuff's getting done? Yeah, so we call that check, 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 pencil whipping, right? And it's a real problem, uh, I think, for all uh, people that are doing checklists. And it, and it depends, too, on what kind of checklist it is. But for the checklist that you really care about super accuracy, we have the capability in our platform to lock it down and make people literally like go through so many hoops to be accurate. But what we found when we did that was that we actually just made people stop doing the checklists. So now what we've done, because we, we have that capability technologically to do that, but it just doesn't work in the real world, right? Um, so now what we've done is we've implemented what we call data accuracy scoring. It's a proprietary thing that only we have. And what it allows us to do is judge the accuracy of the checklist by looking at all of these little KPIs and metadata that's taking place in the background. And so we've decided to open it up and allow people to pencil whip, but then identify that pencil whipping uh, to management, right? So that they can coach on what's actually happening, right? I go back to what I said in the first segment. We we can show you the good, the bad, and the ugly in your operations. But unfortunately, I can't make people be good at their jobs or be honest. I can only provide you with the information you need to then hold them accountable and explain the why. So data accuracy scoring, what's cool about it is, like, if you're trying to make a decision, let's say, across your entire chain on a specific issue, when data accuracy scoring is in, uh, employed, you can literally click on one button. It says accurate and it just filters out all the garbage data so you can get an actual honest opinion on what was this happening on this one question, for instance, or, or this one issue. But then when you want to look at, you can also click 
on a not accurate button and there's a list of people you need to go follow up with and go hey man what's going on here we need to like figure out what you're doing or why you can't seem to get this done right so that's data accuracy scoring and it is massively important today to be able to to scrub that data so easily right because if you just are collecting data and it's like 10,000 million rows in a in an excel format you can't figure out if you're making good decisions on good data or is it garbage in garbage out right so it's pretty cool yeah and is management able to use this uh, essentially in real time or uh, is it required that there's some period of collection to really get a good handle on what's happening you can watch people completing checklists in real time you can actually join their checklist and watch them and collaborate that's another cool feature we have where multiple people can be working on stuff simultaneously. But for the data accuracy scoring, you, they have to submit the checklist because there's an analysis that happens when the checklist gets submitted. Um, so you can see it in near real time, like within a second, right? You can be like, okay, cool, this was accurate or not. But you can also watch people do their checklist while they're doing it. So you know, like if you have a business, right? And it's, let's say it's an auto uh, oil change place. And you know that it's literally impossible for somebody to get from the register to the storage room in less than a minute. And then they answer the storage room as clean question one second later, you go, okay, that might not be accurate, right? And one other thing that we like to do too is if you're having accuracy issues, the best way to solve those is to force people to take pictures of stuff. So that's just a good way to get like extra data on things because now they had to walk over and take a picture and you can tell if it's been taken before and you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, one other benchmark for uh, measuring in real time is social media. If someone's having a bad experience, for example, Nobody's, nobody's bashful about tweeting it or posting it somewhere to say, hey, here I am and look at this garbage. Um, how does management think about utilizing you know, the social media feeds in conjunction with uh, your package? You know, there's a company out there, uh, one of our clients uses, Denny's uses, uh, and I can't think of their name, it just escaped me as soon as you said that. But they, all they do is they, they just scour the web um for uh social media posts and then they create a customer satisfaction rating right off of that and it's interesting because we're actually moving into a study that we're doing right now utilizing artificial intelligence and uh, predictive analytics and uh, we're using um, data um, that we have including some of that uh, date some of that social media data feed and we're doing an entire analysis around predictive analytics and using operations and sales data together to be more predictive and build a better predictive model and that customer sat data is going to be a huge um, aspect of that right just from denny's internal research alone what they realized was that just internally looking at their locations using our platform, the locations that were using our platform the most had 89% higher customer satisfaction than their, their stores that weren't using it at all or using it very little. So there is a huge tie to running great operations and crossing your T's and dotting your I's and taking care of your customers and making your customers happy. Yeah, it's interesting that when you, when you talk about this customer satisfaction experience, uh, unfortunately, a lot of times it takes going to social media to actually get a response and get change, uh, even more so than trying to speak to someone at the local level or even upscaling it to the management team. So that'd be an interesting component. Uh, Tommy, I just got the sign that we're coming down to the short strokes here, just a few minutes to go. I want to give you a chance sure. to tell folks how they can find you if they want to work with you or learn more about you. Yeah, please check us out at opsanalytica.com or my name's Tommy Yanolis, you know, so it'll be in the show notes. Hit me up on LinkedIn, I'd love to talk to you. So please check us out there. Yep, so Tommy, in like the three or so minutes that we have left here, uh, I'd love to give you the final word and maybe share some tips with the audience. Uh, some of the things that you're seeing companies do that either they should be avoiding doing or some things that the, uh, the audience should be doing uh, on a positive note, what can we do better? Sure, so, you know, in our realm, which is large multi-location chains, right? You know, when they started, when they started growing, when they started going like in the 1950s, 60s, all the way through, you know, today, those chains didn't have this technology. Our technology is probably about a decade old where it was actually usable, you know? And so they built these 
So they go, well, we have to manage our operations and we don't have any better way to do it. So they focused on training for memorization, which increases, you know, a lot of your costs, by the way. And also they focused on like paper based systems and and that and they were able to grow. I mean, we have chains that are 14,000, 40,000, just massive numbers of locations. But in the last 10 years, the technology has eclipsed that. And now we have this new realm of technology where you can manage your operations. You can see what's happening. You can effortlessly document and collect data and analyze it and make better, better data-driven decisions, right? That's all available to you. And so what I am seeing is a very slow transformation within the verticals that we serve where people are starting to realize there is a better way than paper. And what you have to realize is this, this, everything we do is all about one thing, a business being able to ensure that their teams are doing what they're supposed to do, identify issues faster, and then having a mechanism, which is the platform, to change processes to fix issues with the ultimate goal of just irritating less customers, right? And the team, the businesses that can do that better and build that muscle and rely on uh, platforms like us, Ops Analytica, to do that are going to start winning. And it's gonna be this thing where you're not gonna understand why are they getting higher sales? Why are they opening more locations? Why are they doing more marketing? Why are they getting better uh, end caps in these strip centers? Whatever it might be, why are they able to do that? And it's not gonna be one thing that you can point to. And it's gonna be very frustrating to the second place or their competitor, because they're not gonna understand that they're just solving the death by a thousand cut stuff. They're identifying issues and solving them faster. We had a quote from one of our clients that said, you keep us from making multi-million dollar mistakes because they have the data now, they have the visibility and the accountability, and that's huge. And you go, well, how is that a multi-million dollar mistake? Well, it becomes a multi-million dollar mistake when you have 750 locations that are open 363 days a year. And if you do something that changes the, the equation by 30 bucks a day, that's millions of dollars, you know what I mean? Across a year for these companies. We're, we're saving a company $10,000 a month by making their employee, their managers take a picture of the register showing everybody's being clocked out, 120K a year. You know, so that's what's going to happen. And every penny that you keep and you don't waste and every customer you keep happy, right? That just means a little bit more sales, one more transaction. So that's what I would say. you got to transition to operations management. Also, because it's going to facilitate everything you want to do in the future. Predictive analytics, automation, robots, you know, all of that's going to require ops management in place and data. Yep, it's the little things, the blocking and tackling, like you said. Tommy, unfortunately we're out of time, but I want to thank you for joining us today on Behind the Numbers. Uh, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, everybody stay safe and have a great 2023. It's going to be a good year. Back at you, man. We've been talking with Tommy Anolis, who's the CEO and founder at Ops Analytica. And again, I'm Dave Bookbinder, and my clients turn to me when they want to know what their most important assets are worth. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to have a conversation. And I want to thank you out there for watching and listening. We can't do it without you. Please hit the subscribe button so that you can stay in touch with all that we're up to, and you'll know when the next episode drops, which, as I always say, should be next week. So until then, take care, everybody. We'll see you next time on Behind the Numbers.